Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hugh Thompson. Everybody, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. I hope you all had a great week during this RSA. It's, it's been, been super busy, a lot of interesting sessions. And I, I tell you, I am so excited about the guests that we have for this year's show. So I'm, I'm going to bring them out in a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about how technology has changed so rapidly over the last couple of years, especially with things like social networking. And how can customers, how can users make good choices online? And how can businesses make good choices faced with all this complexity? So we've got some incredible guests. Uh, but before they come out, I want to share a personal security story with you. And uh, this happened quite a few years ago now. And it was really around a time that was very significant, I think, in American history. It was the premiere of Star Trek Generations. Right? I know, I, how many people out here are Star Trek fans? Okay. Dude, all right. High overlap, not surprising with this crowd. Uh, so, so this was, uh, this was a, a pretty fundamental time for me, you know, because it was kind of passing the movie torch from Captain Kirk to Jean-Luc Picard. Right? It's a big transition. And uh, me and a couple of buddies wanted to bring it in the right way. And so we had this plan. We were going to watch all the previous Star Trek movies just in anticipation of the opening premiere night. So I go to a buddy's dorm, and uh, there's a bunch of people there. Most of them I knew. But there was this one guy that I never met before. And within, I'd say within two minutes of talking to him, he says, I have a second grade level fluency in Klingon, right? I didn't ask any follow-on questions, like, is there an accreditation board, you know? How do you really attest to this? So, you know, just kind of let it pass. We watched the first couple movies, and I think it was after Wrath of Khan that I, I go back and I see this guy, and he's like, hey, check out what I found, right? So he pulls out this big book, and I'm expecting some Klingon manuscript or something, and I, I read it, and it is the manual for the new phone system that was just installed at the university, right? And he said, I'm like, dude, where did you get this, man? He said, well, you know, I was sifting through the trash outside the registrar's office. Again, no questions asked, you know, just kind of let it slide. So I, I look at this thing, and the first thought that pops into my head is free long-distance calls, right? So a couple of buddies of mine and I just kind of divided the thing up, you know, two hours and at least, at least 20 ounces of Joel Cola later, we distill three important facts out of this big manual. Fact number one. The way the system worked is that when you picked up the phone in your dorm room and you dialed a long-distance number, and back then domestic was long-distance too, so you dial any kind of long-distance number, it asks you or it beeps and it expects you to type in your personal long-distance code. So they know who to bill it to. You know, a couple people might be sharing a dorm room. So not, not unexpected and certainly par for the course at the time. So that was fact number one. Fact number two, if you dialed somebody's extension and you got their voicemail, you could hit nine and get a dial tone originating from their extension. Okay, okay, well, that's good. That's okay, that's fine. You know, there was this kind of reason. But obviously, this was mitigated by fact number one, because you'd still have to type in long distance code. Fact number three on page 276 of the manual, in fine print with a star next to it at the bottom, anyone with compelling need can apply for an exemption from the long distance code restriction. So what this was designed for, at least what it said, is say, you know, like you're in the admissions office and you've got to make a whole bunch of long distance calls at once, you, and you're the only person in your office, you may want to lift this restriction, so you just pick up the phone, you dial a number, and it connects. So immediately, we see fact number one, fact number two, fact number three, and we know what we're doing for the next three hours, right? So we went through the phone book, and we started dialing an extension at admissions, get the dial tone, try to dial out, no dice, very disappointing. 
Uh, we tried somebody in HR, right? Figured that they got to make a bunch of calls, no dice. Finally, we get somebody, I think her title was Director of Procurement and Craft Services, right? So they're bringing in food, and we hit nine. Next thing I know, my buddy's talking to his cousin in Jamaica for 20 minutes, right? So now, now what was interesting about this to me is we have a very, very complex system, a complex manual. If you laid down those three facts and presented it like that to anybody, a designer of the system or a user, they recognize that those spell trouble, right? It was clear that you combine those three things and somebody's going to be making some free calls. But because the system was so complex, neither designers of the system or users of the system readily recognize that. And I think that's very interesting. So today, if you look at social networking sites, for example, you've got a lot of complex options around privacy. Are users equipped to make those choices? You've got a lot of employees that are talking about their home life, they're talking about their work life. Are they equipped to make good choices about what they share and not put the business at risk? So we're going to be talking about that during this show. And our first guest is an expert in human choice and consumer behavior. You may remember him from last year's show. He's the New York Times best-selling author of two books on how people behave and scams. I'd like to welcome him, Bob Sullivan. Well, welcome, man. Thank How's you very going? much. Another year, the world hasn't ended. <laughs> that's good, man, dude. That's a These good. These guys must be doing a good job. Congratulations on the new book. Thank you. It's very exciting. Some yeah. very interesting and concerning stories, I think, that you. Uh, there are. There are. I know you've been talking all week about how to keep control of people who are involved in social networks, what they're doing on Twitter and Facebook how uh, they're exposing the company to risks. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole other side to these kinds of risks from social networking, and I'm sure a lot of you have already seen the things that people are doing, consumers, when they're frustrated with companies. I like to say, hell hath no fury, like a web user scorned. Oh, man. So people are signing up for Twitter accounts, and they're saying, I'm angry at Hewlett-Packard, boycott Hewlett-Packard, boycott Funai TV. After just a couple of minutes, you can have tens of thousands of people on your side rallying against a company. Now, I, like I like to do, I brought a film with me here today. Okay. Well, we're going to show Wait, it in a minute, minute, but let me... I haven't seen this film, man. Is this... Should I be concerned about this? Everyone's an adult in the room, right? Dude, I, I don't like the direction this is going, man. <laughs> let me set this movie up for okay. just a little bit. Rock band traveling. Some of you may have seen this. A rock band traveling with very expensive musical equipment. While on the tarmac of the airplane, they look out the window, and they see the folks dealing with the luggage taking great liberties with the guitars. <laughs> United Airlines throwing $33,000 guitars recklessly, and eventually they break, they get frustrated, they call United, United won't help them. The musician dares them to not help. If you do this, I'm going to write a song about you. Everyone's going to see it. <laughs> so we're going to watch the first part of that song, but while you watch the song, I want you to conjure up an image in your mind. You're in charge of marketing for this company. And you've just spent a couple of million dollars on a branding cam campaign. Super Bowl ad, maybe? To make maybe. people feel good about United Airlines. Yeah. And you see 8 million people watch this. Please roll the video. I flew United Airlines on my way to Nebraska. The plane departed Halifax, connecting in Chicago's old air. While on the ground, the passenger said from the seat behind me, My God, they're throwing guitars out there. The band and I exchanged a look, best described as terror, at the action on the tarmac, and knowing whose projectiles these would be. So before I left Chicago, I alerted three employees who showed complete indifference to board. 